Sweet. So today we're going to be talking about how to destroy Bitcoin, game theory and attacks. This is all about proof of work attacks. So any of the examples you see here in this lecture apply to any proof of work blockchains, not just Bitcoin. Bitcoin is useful because it's a, you know, it's a standard, it's the fundamental one. But all of the stuff that applies here can be applied to several other different types of blockchains or types of protocols. <clears throat> all right, a quick lecture overview. We'll start with talking about pool strategies and the attacks that pools allow for, move into forking and our good old friend double spending, then finally into censorship from which Aparna will take off with selfish mining and selfish mining defenses. Pool strategies. So a quick throwback to the two pool reward schemes that we mentioned uh, back in the mining lecture. There's pay for share and there's proportional. Pay for share you get paid out constantly, no variance. And proportional depends on how quickly you found the last block. Now there's actually a trick that miners can do in order to make more profits than they would typically if they had just stuck to one of the two pooling schemes. Now keep in mind with proportional, you get more money the sooner your pool finds a block because, because each share is worth much more relatively than as more shares are added in. Right? As you have more shares added in towards finding a block and the longer it takes to find this block, every share is now worth individually less because it's only a certain fraction of that block. So why would you bother mining in a proportional scheme when every share now has less value? You might as well jump to a different, to a different scheme where in that scheme each share has a set value that never goes down with however many you submit. So pool hopping is the idea that you start off with a proportional, you start off in a proportional pool and then once you hit this point at which your share is not going to be worth less than if you were to join some other scheme, just join that other scheme and then mine from there. That way every miner is able to maximize their own personal profits, albeit at the expense of the pools. Because of this, proportional pools are not feasible in practice because the honest miners who stick with a proportional scheme, who stick in a proportional pool, are cheated out of their money by those who are doing this clever trick. One clever trick, pools hate them. All right, and so this is a, an open problem that remains to be solved, pool hop. This is other idea of cannibalizing pools in which instead of just throwing hash power into the network, you actually take your hash power and you distribute it among other pools. You eat up the rewards without actually giving them anything of value. So a, a quick example to make it more tangible. Imagine that you have a hefty 30% of the network hash power. Right? And for simplicity's sake, let's assume you have one Bitcoin block award uh, for every block. So because you have 30% of the hash power, you expect 30% of the rewards, so you expect 0.3 Bitcoin for your 30% of hash power. Now let's say you win the lottery or something, and you're able to buy 1% more of the total network cash rate or mining equipment that is equivalent to such. The naive thing to do is to stick that 1% in your other pool of 30% hash power, meaning you now have 31 parts of 101 parts of hash power, meaning that the increase in Bitcoin they receive is 0 0.0069 Bitcoin for this 1% hash power. However, there is a strategy that allows us to make more profit than by this naive scheme. Imagine that instead of taking this 1% and putting it into your own pool, you distribute this 1% equally among the remaining 70% of the network. Now the remaining 70% of the network is giving rewards to you based on how much power or how much work you're submitting to the pool. In other words, as you submit shares to the network, or as you submit shares to this, these pools, you're getting money off of them. But you refuse to submit to them any bl valid block headers. So they're paying out of their collective block rewards, but you refuse to give them any effective hash power. They no longer have, like, they are not getting any valid blocks from you because you refuse to give it to them. You just want to eat up their rewards while still keeping their effective hash power the same. So because you own 1% of the 70%, you get one per or you get one out of 71 parts of their effective reward. So you get 0 0.0098 Bitcoin for your 1% instead of if you just honestly mined and put in your hash power directly into the network. So the, what this means is that cannibalizing pools and cheating is more profitable than being honest. And this leads to a huge problem. We can actually model this attacking strategy as an iterative game where every turn you're able to either attack or not attack. This resembles the prisoner's dilemma. 
the, imagine you have these two players, and these two players have the choice as to whether to attack each other or not to attack each other. So in the top right, we have this table that shows what the expected values are based on whether or not one pool attacks another. And we see that pool A, if they choose to attack pool B, are going to gain revenue at the expense of pool B's revenue. But then pool B might as well just attack pool A in turn. Now, if you're familiar with the idea of a Nash equilibrium, it's, an, it's a, tr a set of strategies that each pool would take, or each player would take, that despite the other strategies, is still the most optimal for themselves. We see that the Nash equilibrium in this case, meaning the optimal strategy for the entire group of players, is to attack every other pool. And this is a problem because it means that in real life, if pools were following this theory, then they would all be attacking each other and trying to cannibalize each other's pools, which means that everyone gets less revenue than if they just mined honestly. So if, let's say, that pool 1 is not attacking, there's no reason for pool 2 not to attack pool 1. Like, it's always advantageous for pool 2 to attack pool 1 unless there's this retaliation. So if pools are able to detect these attacks, then sure, you have this long-term solution where anyone who's like, detecting an attack, I don't know, they could refuse to accept blocks from them as a network or in some other way like invalidate the shares that they submit. But until that happens, then you still have a situation where attacking and this having this like, joint cannibalism, cannibalism is more adva advantageous than uh, trying to like, hope that you're not being attacked. Right, so are there any questions about pool wars or, or pool schemes? All right, sweet. Now we're going to go back to our old friend double spending. Now, if you're familiar with double spending, as you must be from the first lecture, it's su successfully spending the same money more than once. But the issue is that we mentioned that we prevent double spending in the first lecture with this protocol. However, there are still some ways to successfully double spend depending on the conditions for which you consider a transaction to be confirmed. Now, let's say that Gloria wants to buy an iPhone zero-day exploit from Aparna on the black market for $1.5 million about 350 Bitcoin, but obviously she does not want to give up her money, hashtag hodl. So how can Gloria double spend on Aparna? In other words, how can she convince Aparna that she's going to get paid without giving her the money? So let's say that Aparna is, in this circumstance, incredibly naive. She's just waiting to see a valid transaction. The moment that she sees a valid transaction from Gloria to herself, saying that she'll give some amount of Bitcoin, in this case 350, she will send over the goods. But then Aparna is vulnerable to this idea of a race attack. If Gloria submits one transaction to Aparna, that's valid. Aparna sees it, submits the goods, but Gloria has actually submitted this other transaction to the rest of the network, then the rest of the network is going to put this other transaction inside a block. That other transaction will be validated. Gloria will get to keep her Bitcoin while still reaping the rewards as if uh, reaping the rewards of Aparna's assumption that she was going to get Bitcoin. In order to make sure that tr transaction two goes into a block instead of transaction one, what Gloria can do is what's called a replace by fee. You put extra money on top of a different transaction to incentivize miners to take that one instead of some other transaction. This is usually what's done in order to make sure that if you submitted a too low fee last time, you can actually have your transaction go through. But in this case, it's used to ensure that an attack goes through, to ensure that this malicious transaction goes through instead of the one where Gloria gives up her Bitcoin. So, Obviously, Aparna shouldn't accept this transaction right as she sees it. Instead, what she can do is wait for a certain number of confirmations. And a confirmation is just waiting for blocks to be put onto the block that holds your transaction. This block on the right has two confirmations because there's two blocks on top of it. So let's say that Aparna instead waits for Z confirmations. Now, clearly, it should be more secure. But the question is, is there still a way for Gloria to double spend, if, even if Aparna is waiting for a certain number of confirmations? So this transaction from Glory to Aparna needs Z confirmations before Aparna sends the goods. In order to double spend, Glory needs to make a private chain. So what that'll look like, Glory will submit this transaction to the network. This transaction is going to build confirmations. After two confirmations, Aparna will send the goods to Gloria. But at this point, Glory is actually, or by this point, Glory has been mining on her secret chain and with all her hash power, is able to produce a new chain. And this new chain is longer than the other chain. Now the problem is that Gloria, or that Aparna, cannot, she can't bring her goods back. She sent them, she can't get them back. So even though this new chain, this old chain is invalidated, Aparna has still given the goods without receiving any Bitcoin. 
meaning that Gloria was able to successfully double spend on Aparna, get this exploit, and keep her Bitcoin. So are there any questions about... Yeah? Wouldn't the honest one grow faster since they have more of the network? Right. The, the question is, wouldn't the honest one go faster since they have more of the network hash power? And the answer is yes. On average, it'll go faster. However, keep in mind that there are still probabilities associated with whether or not you're going to get a block. So if you, uh, even if the honest network is above 50% compared to yourself, there's still probabilities that if you're lucky, you'll be able to get more blocks in a row than the honest network. So you can see here, this, uh, the top one represents the probability that the attacker will catch up to the honest network, and the bottom one is the probability that the transaction is confirmed. In the top one, if you'll notice at 50%, we have a 100% chance, or a 100% probability, that the attacker is able to catch up to the honest network. And the reason for this is pretty straightforward. If you consider the problem to be such that uh, Gloria is at some J blocks behind the honest network, all she needs to do is get lucky enough to catch up to this honest network. And she does that, then once she propagates that chain, she's able to successfully double spend. At 50% or more, she'll always be able to successfully catch up because she'll be producing blocks at exactly the rates, if not more, than the honest network. Meaning that in the case of a 51% attack, you can create a chain of any arbitrary length, <coughs> propagate that, and it, will be, it can be longer than the honest chain if you've worked on it for long enough. There are certain thresholds if you assume different levels of attack power on the, uh, in the attacker's hands, 45%, 30%, and 10%. You'll notice that around six confirmations, we have a 20% confidence, or we have an 80% confidence from the vendor's perspective that the transaction is validated. This is why most Bitcoin transactions are, people tend to estimate six confirmations because rarely will anyone have 30% and like, no one really wants to put in that much power into double spending on a coffee, for example. But if it's some big deal, like a government's trading some giant like, nuclear weapon, then yeah, you might want to wait 100 confirmations. Right. And as I mentioned before, with more than 50% of the network hash power, you can at any point arbitrarily rewrite the blockchain with your own longer chain. Because you'll always be able to catch up. Because the rate at which you produce blocks will always be greater than the honest network. There's a small protocol thing, actually, that prevents this from happening. It's just a small note that every miner will refuse blocks that are more than two hours outside their median time. So if they receive a block that was from, or if they receive a chain full of blocks that were allegedly produced a week ago, then they're not going to accept it. So this is what prevents someone from like, making a huge chain in secret in Iceland and then shorting the network. All right, so... There's also questions about incentives, though. We know that it's possible for Gloria to double spend, but would she really want to? If Gloria has Bitcoin, and in this circumstance she does, even if she double spends, the network or the exchange rate of Bitcoin is going to plummet. Meaning that the value of the Bitcoin that Gloria has, even though she's preserved it in terms of the numbers, it's still going to decrease in value tremendously if people find out that such a hefty, if someone's able to successfully double spend, because now you've lost faith. In the, in the technology. And once you lose faith in the technology, no one really wants to use it because they don't think it has value anymore. All right, so if Gloria isn't staked in Bitcoin, she can actually turn her incentives around and intentionally attack the network by shorting the currency. And uh, shorting, in this case, if you don't know, is just betting on something to decrease in value. And so Gloria can bribe miners, for example. She doesn't have to own any hardware. She doesn't have to have the, all the junk left over after she destroys Bitcoin, but she can bribe others to attack on her behalf, short the network, and then get money out of that. If she has a lot of capital, she can acquire enough um, miners, or she can acquire enough ASICs, or bribe enough miners and pools to get more than 50% of the effective hash power, and then short it then. In other words, by by the destruction of this cryptocurrency, by its decrease in value, she'll be able to profit. So if someone knows they can pull off an attack, they can put a lot of money into shorting it, pull off the attack, and now they've made a huge profit, which is a big issue if there's not a way to prevent, like, to prevent these attacks. And censorship. As I mentioned, Bitcoin's supposed to be censorship-free. You shouldn't be able to regulate who can and who can't use the, use the network. Are there any questions so far about double spending? or attacks. All right. 
So let's say that you're a government that has jurisdiction over mining pools, say China, which is controlled entirely by Gloria in this beautiful picture. And your, she wants to censor this libertarian, Gary Johnson, because she does not believe in free speech. Right? So she wants to censor Gary Johnson from using any Bitcoin. So what she does is say, Gary Johnson, I know all of your addresses. I know all the ones you possibly make for some reason. And she says that she will not accept any transactions. She will not validate any transactions from Gary Johnson. But this does not work unless she's 100% of the network. Eventually, someone is going to include a transaction from Gary Johnson in their block. It will get into the blockchain, and now Gloria's plans have failed, and Gary Johnson was able to move his money around. So this will only cause delays and inconveniences. But remember, we have the ability to fork. So if you're, remember, you're Gloria, you're, you have 50% or more of the network hash power. So what you can do is mandate that all these Chinese pools will refuse to work on a chain that is containing transactions from Gary Johnson's addresses. You would tell this to the world as well. So anytime you see a chain containing transactions from Gary Johnson, you just fork it, make it longer, and then finally that chain is invalidated because miners will follow the longest chain. And that transaction yeah, it can no longer be published. So miners are going to stop trying to publish Gary Johnson's transactions, and finally Glory will have succeeded. And this is what's called punitive fork, to fork whenever there's some block you don't like, in, in this case, in the context of censorship. But keep in mind that this only works if you have more than 51% of the hash power. Let's say that one day uh, all of Gloria's ASIC mining farms burn down, and actually has 10% or 20% of the mining hash power. What does she do then? Well, there's a strategy called feather forking, in which you don't need a majority of the hash power, but you're still able to make it such that the incentive for miners to contain G Gary Johnson's transactions in their blocks is much, much lower. And uh, you'll see why. All right, so you'll announce that you'll attempt a fork until Gary's transactions have a certain number of confirmations. And you'll give up after like, K confirmations. All right, so let's say that you own uh, some value Q. Uh, in this case, Q is 20% of the network hash power. That means that the probability of getting a single block is 20%. The probability of getting two blocks is 4%. That's the chance you have of orphaning Gary Johnson's transactions. That's not very good. But keep in mind, now the other miners are aware that there is this 4% chance of their blocks being orphaned. And because of that, they now need to decide whether it's actually worthwhile to contain Gary Johnson's transactions in their block. The expected value of their block rewards, if they include Gary Johnson's transactions, is going to be 96%, or the Honest Network's probability of like, keeping that chain times the block award plus whatever transaction fee Gary Johnson puts up. And the expected value of not including his transactions is just the block award because no one's going to fork them. So we see that if the expected value of both is to be equal, Gary Johnson has to make up for that 4% difference, meaning he has to pay $2,500 per transaction in order to incentivize miners to take his transactions because only then is the expected value of keeping his transaction in a block actually going to be worthwhile to the miners. Right? So this isn't direct censorship, but by playing on the incentives that miners have, you're able to effectively censor someone or keep them from being able to use Bitcoin because no miner wants to go out of the way to force someone to, like, or to include someone's transactions in their block if it doesn't profit for them. Right. So are there any questions about censorship? Mm -hmm. So the question was, uh, in the context of shorting the market, what's to stop someone from this insider trading? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by insider trading. Uh, if this means that someone in the Chinese government or one of the Chinese pools is planning an attack, and they know this, and therefore they're going to act on this information. I guess more like right before the government, the Chinese government ban ICOs, mm -hmm. Well, there's nothing to stop them. That's pretty much the answer. Uh, though, you wouldn't short the market necessarily by doing anything directly with the blockchain. You just tell someone, I'm going to buy a bunch of Bitcoin from you and give it back to you in a month or give it back to you in five days. So you buy it at some price and then it drops in value and now you get to keep the extra profit. All right, any other questions?
Cool. All right, Aparna, it's your turn for Selfish Mining and Defense. Hello? Can you guys hear me okay? Cool. Um, okay, so, so far we've been talking about attacks that require 51% or majority of the network's computational power. But we're now going to progress to a section where we talk about attacks where with just 33% or even just 25% you can attack the Bitcoin network. So let's talk about selfish mining. So imagine you're a miner and you just mine your block. Now instead of immediately cashing out and broadcasting this block to the rest of the network, you decide to keep it a secret and try to find another block on top of this. Um, this is basically called selfish mining or block withholding. And the idea is you're trying to waste the rest of the network's computational power so, uh, by withholding this block, which is why the term selfish mining. Um, now, if you succeed in finding the second block, you have successfully fooled the rest of the network because they still believe that they are working on the longest proof of work chain. But in reality, the longest proof of work chain is a secret which only you know. And now you continue to mine on your secret chain. Well, what happens if the network now finds a block? Well, you simply broadcast your two secret blocks making all the work that the network has done so far invalid. So while the network has been working on what they thought was the longest proof of work chain, you had all this free time, you bought yourself this time to work on the real proof of work chain and raised your expectation of profits. So you basically invalidated the new block which the network produced. But what happens now if you were in the process of mining the second secret block on top of your new block, but the network finds an honest block before you find your second secret block, <coughs> well, all you do at that point is you compete with this honest block which was just mined and try to get as many people to know about your block before they hear about the other block so that yours becomes the next accepted block and miners start working on yours. If, so something interesting here is if on average you're connected to just 50% of the network and you can just convince these 50% of people about your block first before the other one, then even with just 25% of mining power, you can, your, your profit gains are much higher. And now if you have 33% of mining power, you could be an isolated individual who just is connected to maybe one or two people in the network and you can still lose this propagation rate every time and know that this malicious mining strategy is still more profitable. Why? Because the chances of you finding two secret blocks in a row is now much higher with 33% of mining power which means you automatically invalidate any single block that the network finds. Okay, so something to note here is that selfish mining is not actually observed in practice because it is economically unfeasible for anyone to own, say, 33% or even just 25% of this computational power, unless you're maybe the Chinese government and maybe you're mining your long secret blockchain that you're going to publish in 10 years and overthrow the work of the rest of the world. But that's something we don't know about yet. But if there's an attack, you always need defenses. And now we're going to look at a bunch of different defenses against selfish mining and end up looking at one which actually works. So the first idea is a dummy idea, as the name suggests. It's called dummy block signatures. Um, the idea is basically along with the proof of work block, you also include all these witness signatures of whoever sees this block. So what that means is before the rest of the network can continue mining, they have to 
have a certain number of threshold signatures on a block, proving that it was witnessed by enough of the network before they can continue working on it. So as we see here, if our selfish miner created, oh, yeah, if our selfish miner creates the secret block right here, it's invalid because he's mining on top of a block which doesn't have any witness signatures from the network. However, what this paper does not account for is what if our selfish min miner creates multiple identities of himself and fills out a bunch of fake signatures and then his secret block is now, val is now valid. Um, also, the paper doesn't really talk about what this minimum threshold number of signatures look like or how much witness data you need before you can continue mining on the proof of work chain. So that leads to maybe potential delays in consensus. Um, and this, this defense also requires some fundamental changes to the Bitcoin blockchain on what constitutes a valid block. So that means if, if this defense were to be implemented, you would need a hard fork in the Bitcoin blockchain, which is very hard to do. Um, so no dummy solution. Instead, let's look at a fork, fork punishment rule. The idea here is anytime you see any sort of fork, penalize all the people who tried to fork. So in this situation, neither the selfish miner nor the honest miner get any block reward. Instead, a miner who can prove that there was a fork in the blockchain gets half of the block reward. Um, however, the drawback of this is you're punishing honest miners who, for, for no apparent reason, and this in itself constitutes a different kind of attack. And this, this defense also requires fundamental changes to the reward distribution mechanism of Bitcoin, and again requires a hard fork to implement. So if you're familiar with the scalability debates or transaction malleability, um, or you've been hearing about SegWit, you know how hard it is to convince the Bitcoin community to implement anything new. And miners who don't update their software cannot implement any of these defenses. So can we do better? Hell yeah. Um, so this solution is basically one where a miner waits to hear about all the competing blocks within a certain period of time and then randomly chooses one of them to mine on top of. <coughs> The, this, while it raises the profit threshold from 0 to 23.2%, is actually still has some drawbacks in the sense that you don't, you don't know what this time period that you have to wait for is going to look like. So again, it could cause potential delays in consensus of the network. So let's now look at the last flawed solution before we look at a good solution. Um, the idea behind this unforgeable timestamp solution is you have a central party who issues these timestamps every 60 seconds. Now every person who is a miner and is working on a block updates his block's latest timestamp value to whatever this person issues. Um, so now when you have two competing blocks that are published within 120 seconds, a miner prefers the block that is fresher. So in this case, our selfish miner's block is rejected simply because it's two minutes later than the other block. Why do we do that? Well, if you remember, we don't want a selfish miner to have this additional time to create the secret block on top of his own block. So by taking this the fresher block, we're not letting him buy any new time and waste the computation of the rest of the network. Questions about that? OK. But the drawbacks are still that the tie-breaking rules don't apply when you don't have this propagation rate. So if our miner here mined two blocks way before the rest of the honest network did, and then honest network just mines one block, 
he has the longest proof of work chain, which means none of the tie breaking rules apply anymore. And he basically just wasted all their computational resources again. Further, if an attacker has more than 40% of computational power, he doesn't even need 51%, just above 40% below 51%. All these defenses are still worthless. And the biggest drawback is you're introducing a trusted third party who creates these timestamps every 60 seconds. And this pretty much contradicts Bitcoin's central philosophy. Like, does Bitcoin and centralization ever go together in a single sentence? So let's now look at one possible defense solution that actually works. It gets a little technical from here, so we'll go a little slow. So the, the advantages of this publish or perish scheme is basically that it's backward compatible, which means you don't need a hard fork to implement it because it doesn't change any of the blockchain's fundamental rules. Like it doesn't change how, what makes a block valid or how the rewards have to be redistributed. Um, it also, this incentivizes selfish mining even when the selfish miner has a bunch of secret blocks. So if you remember, all the previous defenses only worked when we had a block uh, block propagation rates. But this one tries to target even a miner who creates this long secret chain. The approach basically uses a fork resolving policy um, and Bitcoin's blockchain uses a height, height policy but this uses a weighted fork policy. Um, and we'll take a closer look at what that means. So before we understand it, let's take a look at some of the definitions which will help us build up our mental model. So tau basically is the maximum number of times that it takes to propagate any block in the Bitcoin network. In time basically means one, a child block or a block whose height value is greater than the local head. So a child block is basically a block whose height value is greater than the local head. And it's basically this image right here. Um, and the second definition is basically two competing blocks that are published within uh, the upper bound of time of each other. So this image right here. Like if this was the local head that was published, this block is published within, oh, I realized that Uh, within tau seconds of, yeah, of that. So a couple of other definitions that will help us understand better are uncle. So a child's uncle is basically a block that was competing with its parent in time. So this image right here depicts what an uncle here is. If this is a child's parent, this block that was published within tau seconds after its parent was published is an uncle. And this block that was not published within tau seconds does not become its uncle. And another important definition is this concept of weight, which basically means the number of in time blocks plus the number of uncle hashes that are embedded in these blocks. So the idea we're gonna be using here is we're embedding the uncle hashes in all the following blocks. Questions so far? Okay. Um, so let's now look at how the whole process plays out. If one chain is longer height-wise than the other, by k or greater blocks, the miner will mine on that chain. So what that means is if chain A is longer, let's, let's fix k to be 5. Now if chain A is longer than chain B by 6 blocks, our miners will automatically mine on chain A. Now if chain A is longer than chain B by just 4 blocks, the miners will find the weight of chain B and the weight of chain A and mine on the heavier of the two chains. 
Now what if the weights of both chain A and chain B are the same? Well, then we'll randomly choose between one of the two. K is just a random parameter which we're setting. Um, if K is equal to infinite, the first rule never applies because a single chain is never infinitely longer than any other chain in the world. Okay, so now let's look at what actually happens. So the miner has a single secret block and a competing block is now published. What that means is time for a block race. That gives the miner two separate options. The first is the selfish miner can publish his block, which means his block's weight contributes to the weight of this honest chain. Or the second solution is the miner can keep his block a secret, which means his block's weight contributes neither to the honest chain, neither to the selfish chain. In both scenarios, the secret block which the miner owns does not help him in any way win this block race. Let's take a closer look at both these scenarios. So in choice one, if the miner chooses to publish S, this is S, this will be the uncle of the honest block H right here, since it's published within this tau period of time of this. And S is competing with this honest node right here. So that means S now can counts into the weight of both the honest chain and of the selfish chain. Does that make sense so far? Um, so if you note that, if you notice, the weight of the honest chain and the weight of the selfish chain is both three, but the weight here, one, two, three, and then one, two, three. And the weight of the, the height of the honest chain is two, because it's just this and this, but the height of the selfish chain is three, which means our selfish miner has to do a lot more work to, to waste the work of the rest of the network. Now let's look at choice two, the scenario where the selfish miner doesn't publish S. So in this case, the selfish miner waits and publishes his block S after this time period tau. In which case, the honest miners, like his weight does not count into the chain of the honest miners because he doesn't become an uncle of this block here. And his weight doesn't also count into the selfish chain because it, it's not an in time block, remember? What, what's interesting here is both the weight of the honest chain and the weight of the selfish chain are both two, because one, two, one, two. Um, but the height of the honest chain is three, oh, is two, while the height of the selfish chain is three, which again means that our selfish miner has done a lot more work than the honest miners. That's the only way he can waste the work of these honest people. Regardless of which option the selfish miner chooses, S, will, S, which is his secret block, will not contribute only to the weight of the selfish chain. It'll either contribute to the weight of both the chains or it'll contribute to neither chain. Basically, the idea is this completely nullifies the advantage of knowing any secret block S. So if you look at these graphs here, um, the first one is the relative revenue of the selfish miner within the publish or perish defense. And as you see, um, as the selfish mining's computational power share goes, grows, um, his expected revenue also kind of grows exponentially. Ideally, we'd like that to be a linear line like this, but no one's found a linear solution so far. Um, the second one compares publish or perish right here with all the other defenses we talked about earlier in lecture. And as we see, um, once we cross this 0.4 threshold, this clearly is the best defense that we have so far. That's not ideal. But even this has 
a few limitations. Um, the first is it assumes that Bitcoin is going to be synchronous, but Bitcoin aims to be asynchronous, which means there's no global concept of time. And because of this, it means this defense is precisely useless. Um, the second is whenever this failsafe parameter K is set to any value greater than one, you can, an attacker can publish his block just before the tau boundary gets over or just before the in time session and confuse all the other honest miners about whether his block is in time or not. Other, other uh, limitations of this solution are it neglects real world factors and doesn't, it doesn't take into account natural force which might, up, which might happen, um, nor does it take into account transaction fees or how multiple selfish miners can collude to compete with each other. Basically, this is also incentive incompatible, which basically means a miner's share in computational power should is not directly proportional to his expected reward. But yeah, that's pretty much all for today. That was pretty technical. Um, yeah, so feel free to ask any questions. Yes. By doing, okay, by selfish mining. Yeah. So the idea is if, if you are the only person who mines blocks every time and no one else gets a chance to mine block, that means you're the only one who's getting block rewards, right? Yeah. So if we go back to these slides, um, whoever mined this block is not going to get a block reward. And instead, you're going to get the block reward for both this and this block. Yes, exactly, because no one else knows about this block here till you've published it, right? So you're the only one who's known about it for so long. So, of course, you're the only one who can make a profit off of that. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay, if not, um, so... Next week's lecture is going to be on proof of stake and crypto economics. Your homework for this week is to come up with an attack and a defense. Go grab a partner, meet new people, or an, another option you have is come out to our deep dive that we have this Saturday from 12 to 4 p.m. It's going to focus on proof of stake, which is going to be covered extensively in next week's lecture. So you don't have to stay the whole time, just a couple hours, but yeah, you can do either one of the homeworks. Cool.